In something of a change to my podcasting schedule, I had arranged to have a chat with my friend Vicky Wushay. Vicky is a very successful property investor from the UK with a number of successful books under her belt as well. And there were so many things we wanted to talk about, but we both decided it would be more pertinent to talk about things that are going on right now. And as such, I didn't want to have any hesitation in releasing the podcast so the podcast is recorded today the 19th of march 2020 so i'm going to release it today as well and so hopefully you'll be able to listen to this whilst it's still relevant if you are listening to this after the crisis it might be a at least an idea or a testament to mindsets and attitudes and things that were going on during that time uh, but i hope you'll enjoy the conversation and get some benefit out of what we talked about and uh, about creating positivity and opportunity opportunities through challenging times that we are going through and the ones that may yet be to come. Welcome to the Loki Podcast with John Ball from Present Influence. Today I have a very special guest on the Loki Podcast. I'm very happy to introduce Vicky Wuchet. Hello Vicky, welcome to the podcast. Hello, how are you? I am fantastic and I'm delighted to have you with us. Let me tell you a little bit about Vicky then. Vicky has gone from being a single mother on a limited income to being a successful property investor, business owner, international speaker and author. Now, Vicky is in high demand as an inspirational speaker and a podcast guest, so we are very lucky and privileged to have her with us today. And she regularly supports her clients to hone their messages and create business purpose whilst putting the audience front and center in every talk. Now, Vicky spends the rest of her time encouraging her clients to grow their business and create the futures that they want and desire. She is the author of three property investment books. One of them is a fiction book about a near perfect future, a future world where she is, and she is now coveted book award nominee for her fifth bestseller, The Wealthy Retirement Plan, a revolutionary guide to living the rest of your life in style. Now, I think we can all agree that that is a very impressive resume. Vicky, great to have you with us. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, it just sounds funny listening to that now. And it's like, what? Does any of that matter anymore? Uh, no, I've got enough toilet roll. I'm okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, we are. We are in some interesting times. And yes. before before we started the call, I know that we uh, we thought that it might be worthwhile at least right now to to address that so this is one of the times that i'm going to put a podcast out very quickly well ahead of what i would normally have scheduled because we want to address what is currently going on at the moment and you have some particular thoughts on that that you wanted to share so let's so let's start there today on the podcast well i think we can all admit that these are unprecedented times not just in our lifetime but actually probably in the the history of the world. Nothing this dramatic has happened since the extinction of the dinosaurs. Um, And I wonder if that will end up being a metaphor for when we look back on this period as to what's happened. What are going to be the equivalent dinosaurs that we won't see when we get out the other side? What are we going to change in such a way through this that we will never again do those things? So will we still do massive live events to come and see a speaker or will everything move online or much like we've done with music we stopped making records we put everything on ipads we made everything digital and then there was a reverse back to records becoming a collector's items and i think as business owners because let's speak as business owners for a minute and then i'll touch back on the human side Mm. but as business owners we need to recognize that there is an unknown future. Everything we know really has been wiped off the slate. And what we need to do is get back to back to basic values and then rethink how we can best serve what is effectively a brand new client with effect from today. Um, And they may be a brand new client again by next week because things are changing so much. It's, I mean, it's going to be very hard at the moment to say exactly what's going to change or how the landscape is going to look after, after all this crisis time, this period of quarantine. It's demonstrated, at least in, in many ways, how fragile our current structure was 
uh, and how not set up for supporting the people in it that the world has been uh, mm. for, in the majority of cases. But uh, interestingly now, we already are seeing signs of uh, environmental recovery and improvement just from the, uh, the massive decrease in pollution. Mm. Again, possibly a, a wake-up time for us is like, well, okay, this is an ex- this is a time of extreme measures, but the, the world is in some ways benefiting from this as well. But we're going to go through some difficult transitions yeah. and it's probably going to be painful. And I think it was always going to be the case. We were never going to escape getting to a future without some level of pain mm. and and without some level of loss as well. But uh, in, in the meantime, you know, I think it's one of the most essential things is to to keep the principle of always looking to turn what's coming up as challenges in, into opportunities for yourself and, and create, create positive meaning out of what's going on. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and that's why I love talking to you. you know, we've known one another of old and, and share sort of similar belief patterns, I feel, that, that this is shocking. I think the core thing here, if we, if we just touch on this for a minute, which is outside of, of the topic of presenting or even business is, yeah how you manage your own mindset through this, how you manage the flow of data and what data you receive in order to manage your mindset is going to be absolutely crucial. I've had so many messages from clients, um, people, friends, etc., saying that they are really struggling with anxiety and fear. And I felt those tendrils myself. So I have to distance myself. I don't have alerts on my phone and my watch that go every second da-da, this is happening, da-da, somebody have died, da-da, this is happening, da-da. Because actually, when something important happens, people in your network tend to send you a message and let you know, or you get a proper email about it, you know. They, they tend to, and I think this is the maybe the, the darker side of what's going on at the moment, is that we, we all, always feel that we need to stay fully informed, especially in a, in a crisis time. But it, there is a, fine, a very fine line between being informed and, and being obsessively uh, and compulsively addicted to the information that's coming out to a point where it's going to negatively affect you. In fact, many mm. people have already said that one of the uh, one of the downsides, one of the biggest negative effects of this is also what the, the national psyche or international psyche in this case, because people are distressed, worried, panicked. And and most people don't know how to deal with that or, or where to go with it. And uh, people people are panicking, they're panic buying and they're uh, panicking with each other. And who, who knows, who knows what else is going to uh, going to come from that just because people don't generally know how to handle these kinds of emotions. But I also see that people do get ob- obsessive about watching the news reports. Remember like September the 11th, you know, that was uh, just being replayed over and over again. They kept playing the, the towers falling over and over again. And the, the studies into that were showing that it was very damaging psychologically to people to keep watching that stuff. Mm. So, so I think you're right. So, you know, be informed, of course. We, we must stay informed. We need to know the latest of what's going on and what the, what the current restrictions are and what's, what's being done, what's happening. But try not to be obsessively informed yeah. and, and take yeah. a break from it and put your mind on other things. Look at some, some videos of cute puppies and kittens yes. and things like that, you know. Yes. Yes. <laughs> I remember go, it's not all so terrible. Your family if you're allowed to. If, you know, if I, think, <laughs> I think it's like we're in an international car crash and we're all slowing down to rubberneck and that isn't helpful Yeah. on the other side of the road and everything else. And so that sort of brings us back to the point of presenting and how we show up. Um, and I believe how we show up will come from our values and what you are going to see, what you're going to notice is people taking advantage. And we've already seen that certainly in our country where people have been um, buying up supplies of face masks, gloves, um, hand sanitizers, etc., and then selling them for, you know, five times the price. Um, also heard on one of the news reports, a doctor saying to people, please stop coming to the hospital and stealing our protective gear. It's there for yeah, the medical staff. So people were popping into hospital and then when no one was looking, they're stealing the gloves or stealing the aprons that, that our medical staff were putting their lives at risk. And I think you're going to find people behave like that. Sure. And whether it's greed or a fear response, 
it's actually still back down to mindset. What's really important out of all of this, and if you can start to identify that for yourself, go back to what are your core values? Unless you've ever done this through some personal development in the past, this might, if you're listening to this podcast, be a completely random set of words. What, what do we mean by go back to your values? But it's about what's important to you. Is it your family? Is it trust? Is it love? Is actual physical contact really important to you? Or is it the ability to speak to people really important to you? And when you work out what's important to you, you can then also work out what the threats are to what's important to you. So some of the work I've been doing with clients already is helping them get back into the logical. So out of the emotional side of their brain, where the fear is, and into the logical side of their brain, by getting them to think about their money because money is actually something that people will be worrying about even if they're not worrying about it consciously or sit down work out how much you've got how much do you need I mean I worked out with one client yesterday that just in savings alone bearing in mind they're not going to be able to have any holidays they're not going to use much in the way of petrol so then all of the, the luxury things are going to go really because the shops are going to be shut so if you just go back to the basics of you know food um, mortgage and utility bills then she had seven months worth of money mm. in savings already so can you just take a breath now now there's going to be people out there that don't have seven months of money and maybe only have a month's worth of money if that start, start yes but start to look at what your financial position is because even if you don't like the answer knowing it will make you calmer. So one hand, manage the data of we said coming in so that you're not adding in the fear, then control the fear with understanding what's important to you, then look at what the risk is to what's important to you, which is things that you can do something about. And now you've got this sense of calm. Now you can start to show up in the world as a calmer person. And then if you've got a business, so a lot of your audience will be people who were speakers or presenters. So either they came to other people's events and spoke, they will probably have been cancelled. If not now, then shortly. Or they ran their own events where they spoke and they will have had to cancel those as well. This doesn't mean to say the end of everything because if you can come back, centre yourself with what's really important to you and understand your values, now put your self into the new mind of what if it's effectively a brand new customer facing brand new challenges with your valid values your knowledge your experience and your understanding of what other people are going through how can you show up and help them mm. and that can be the way that you can shift your business so that you can do good you so you can give this stuff for free if you choose to or you can shift the business into some form of online business, online coaching, online speaking, etc. This one, one of the things I've been seeing online already is um, uh, an awful lot of people starting to offer trainings, webinars, coaching on shifting your business into uh, into a virtual or online business and a re remote working. And um, I've I've always really thought that, that that was the future. There there are clearly some jobs that can't be done remotely, as we are definitely seeing during this uh, during this period of quarantine and the likes. That uh, we we you know people can't uh, work from home in the supermarket or in the hospital. Is that we 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 have core people who have to be able to go and do the jobs. But in the majority of cases, um, probably most people who are going to offices and daily commutes and the likes do not need to and um, people realizing that uh, um, a lot of the time that they spend in all these meetings nowadays that could actually be um, dealt with much quicker on an online meeting or in, a, in emails and things that uh, could just actually benefit us so much more and benefit the environment save business costs there, there are going to be some great opportunities uh, for for those who uh, who are willing to to take them on and, and rise up to the challenge now I, I understand that this is also going to be a period of time where some people are going to really struggle um and and maybe find it very hard to stay afloat and i think that's uh you know i to some degree i can relate to that because i i started out 
in, from leaving a full-time job to setting up my own business when recession hit the UK. And that was possibly the worst time that I could have done it, but I was fairly naively confident that it would uh, that it would work out okay. And in it, and it and it didn't really. It didn't go so good. Um, it was undoubtedly very challenging. But guess what? I'm still here, and uh, I made it through. And it was a really tough and painful time, um, but it was a, a real testament to developing some resilience. And to get into a level where it's like, well, if I can withstand that and come through it, I can pretty much come through anything. So, so I don't need to be so afraid of this stuff anymore. But I think probably it's because you had the right mindset and you were clear on the value that you could offer to people. I did exactly the same as you. Um, I was made redundant, so I didn't have the choice about giving up a job. But I started out property investing just as the recession hit. And it was just like, oh no as soon as I buy them they're literally dropping off the cliff in value um yeah so challenging times but as you say it's the resilience and I think we're going to surprise ourselves as individuals as communities as wider societies and then ultimately as the world as to how resilient we are um and I think I think we've got levels of ways that we can show that resilience and humanity and there's that on the individual side how you show up as a as a human being to your neighbors in the shops etc the how to be sensible and control all that we've spoken about but in terms of being a business you've mentioned it so many people are doing that how to get your business online well quite frankly if you didn't already have a virtual business what makes you think that you've got the skills to then teach other people how to. So I think you've got to stay, I'm not limiting you. I don't want to limit anybody who's listening. But I think you've got to you've got to come from a place where what is your knowledge and your expertise and how can you build on that? Because I think what you'll have is greater authority and greater reputation. And you'll be coming at it from a genuine belief of helping other people, not a desire to make money. Now, I'm not saying that all of those people that you've just mentioned that have already got their courses up, that they've been very quick off the mark, that they're just out there to make money, but a percentage of them will be seizing opportunities. Mm-hmm. And good luck to them. That is, that is entrepreneurship, if you like. It's spotting an opportunity and going for it. Equally, I don't think that we should be taking everything that we're doing and putting it online for free. So I'm part of one mastermind group. And the whole conversation yesterday was, I've created this course, Um, I'm accelerating my, I was already planning this course, I'm accelerating the delivery of this course, putting it all online, um, and I'm going to do it for free. Why Why are you going to do it for free? How are you going to make your income? I think we have a responsibility to make sure that we then don't need to rely on the government and the mortgage companies for mortgage holidays or, um, you know, rely on family members to bring us food packages or whatever else we need to be able to make sure that we can generate some degree of income and we're nowhere near going to degree, need the degree of income that we've had in the past. I mean, I listened to um, to one client that I was speaking to at the end of last week and they were telling me that they draw £10,000 a month as, as, a, as a family unit into their family through wages, income and all sorts of other, everything else. And that, that was great for them say a month ago because of the lifestyle that they lead but actually what they only need now is 2000 Mm. therefore you don't have to sack everybody in your business so that you can still take 10,000 when you really only need 2000 you could take 4000 out of your business leave 6000 in your business and then speak to your members of staff and look at how you can start to change the business and work differently and not have those knock on effects so there's lots of ways that we're going to be able to think differently and be more ethically but in terms of the presenting which is is the core of of this conversation it's got to be about what is your message and not from ego me i know i struggle with that cuz the only world I know is my world. So I tend to use the word I a lot, but I hope that the sharing of my insights is always of value to the person who listens because that is my intention. I might use Mm. the word I rather than we or rather than you because I'm the one who's had the insight, but I'm sharing my insight with the 100% intention of helping you 
achieve whatever it is that this insight is set out to achieve, whether that's to make more money, to save more money, to invest in property, to grow your business, to clear your mindset. That's, that's the purpose of the conversation. And so how can we as presenters change the way we work, acknowledge that we've got a brand new client in a brand new world, identify their needs and then get our messages across to them? Yeah, well, I mean the the audience for the for the podcast I mean, is varied to, to a degree, but it is essentially aimed at business owners and how they present themselves and and and, and their business. And I think it's important to understand that there there are going to be paradigm shifts because of because of what's been going on, and uh, and a lot of that is going to be uh, probably already seeing it to some degree. I think seeing. Um, one one thing that was that stood out for me yesterday in just reading the papers was seeing people talking about um Richard Branson I don't know if it was his decision or the or, or if it was the because I don't know if he directly decides what goes on with Virgin Islands um Virgin, Virgin yeah. Airlines but um that they've given asked the staff to take eight weeks unpaid mm. leave mm. and um, and probably you know as, as someone who was once a, a trolley dolly myself uh uh, most most uh, flight attendants aren't really set up. Uh, I mean, I, I did take sort of some months of unpaid leave when I was in the airline, but I, if I had that been enforced, I, I really don't know uh, that I would have been able to to manage it. But but it's when not you a see that a highly paid job, that means that that airline staff are going to have ten thousand or even maybe five thousand pounds in savings, and and what does he think they're going to live on? Well, this is it. But I mean. Uh, that is clearly the point that he he's not short of money himself, <laughs> and and I think that one of the things that's coming up is we're seeing other people with businesses saying, you know, we're going to look after our staff. We're not going to ask people to to go without. We're going to try and you know, share share the burden with everybody. Mm. And that there are more people doing that and making those steps up. And it's like, well, this sort of um, I, I don't know if we could put it down to corporate greed or maybe it was just a, a bit of an unfortunate uh, decision thinking from a, a profit, but it's still thinking from that profit perspective rather than the, we're, we're all in this together thing of mm. co- corporate CEO salaries and the likes is something that does need to be addressed because people are, you know, some some corporations have CEOs that are earning probably more, uh, more or as much or more money as all of their uh, sort of, lower end employees put together yes and and that is insane and it's fascinating i wrote uh, you mentioned the books that i've written book number four is a book called the new estate uh, insights in the 22nd century and it came about when i was working with this mentor and, and just obviously some of my frustrations came out they come out a lot when we have families events we're always looking at you know how we can solve the pothole problem or how, you know something comes up in the news and we come up with an idea you and I were talking about it just before the podcast started so my mentor said to me well why don't you write a book about it then you know just put this in a book and I went oh that's a good idea and I could make it so that we could then debate the chapters and see if we could improve the chapters so I imagined a world in the future that you know for me would have a lot more of the values that I wanted and this is pertinent to the point that I've been making all the way along so I imagined a world in the future how I would want that ideal world to be and then I started to work backwards and think what are the things that would need to change in order for my world to be a nicer place to live in so I created the fair wage for all act which actually in 2015 didn't exist now I think it's called the living wage act so that's come in since um And then I actually did away with celebrity and sports star extreme salaries. And I remember going along for a TED Talk interview. um, And my talk was about responsibility enough and contribution. Responsibility is taking responsibility. Enough is recognizing how much we already have. And really, you can have more. So you can have more than enough. You can even have much more than enough. But if you recognize that you've got enough, you can then be in a position where you can contribute more to others and start to think you don't come from a place of greed. You come from a place of abundance so you can help others. And I did that talk because it was about, you know, why do we pay so much to footballers and actors and actresses as much as I love watching films, but then our school teachers, 
our doctors, our nurses, et cetera, don't earn a great deal of money. And now we're in the position where films are shut down, TV shutting down, there's no sports going on. And so will those people not be earning money? So have I actually in 2015 predicted some of the components that are now going to be brought to the front? And then is it a time for us to start to look at this? Does, do these things matter to us so much that we are prepared to pay so much for them? One of the uh, things that I heard on the news, and I think it was Angela Merkel, the, um, the German leader, say, thank you to everybody in the shops at the tills. How many times have you been to your local shop and not said thank you to the person when you have taken your till receipt and your shopping and gone? I hear it constantly mm. because I tune into that. I always say thank you to the bus driver when I got off the bus. You can't say thank you to a train driver because you never get to see them. But I say mm. thank you to people as I go past. How many people don't do that? And actually, if it wasn't now, for those people putting themselves at risk and going into their local supermarkets to serve us, to panic buy the things that, quite frankly, we probably don't need, um, that shop wouldn't be open. So we start to reevaluate these things, and that can feed into what we, what we do as, as pre presenters. So what, what is the message that you want to put out there about what your beliefs are? Because I feel that we can shape the world in two ways. We're going to shape the world with how we change our businesses. And that's not just us as presenters. That's all businesses are going to reshape the world in terms of the structure. But us as individuals are going to be able to shape some of the values. I feel that, oh, and I'd love this to be true. But I feel that as individuals, if we could get together and a bit like Greta Thunberg said something that started to resonate. And from her, the kids went on school strikes. There was the whole green movement. She said something that so resonated with everybody that people started to agree and follow. And it's, it's shifted almost in 12 months, really, the green agenda. Mm. What else do we need to look at? What else... Could we as individuals go, actually, you know what? I, I've been aware of this thing. I've let this thing slide for years. I haven't done anything about it. Is this now something that I could talk about as an individual? Or it might even be that this has resonance in my business. I mean, look how many homeless people we have. I work in property. I have endlessly tried to find ways that I could help get people from homelessness into my properties but it is so complicated mm. because they don't have an address in england where we have a benefit system because they don't have an address they can't get benefits but i can't afford to buy houses pay the mortgages on them and let you live in them for free so i've got to get you to get the benefits but what i could do is provide that baseline where you had a safe home but the system was so complicated that there were always these barriers that I never quite had enough time and energy to push through. So is that something that now I'm going to have more time on my hands that I could tackle? You know, I, it's, yeah, it's going to I, be fascinating, isn't it? It is fascinating and, and, and uh, an interesting area. I think I personally think the homelessness issue in the UK is far worse than people know because there are a ton of invisible homeless. And I yes. know this because I was nearly one of them. Mm -hmm. And, um, People who just, you know, they can't afford to have their own place. They can't afford to rent or buy. They don't have the income. The job prospects aren't necessarily there for them. And they're in a very much a, a catch-22 sort of situation of um, having to rely on family or friends or um, have some kind of ho home situation that is far from, far from ideal. Mm. Uh, and... Uh, and I do think you know, one one thing I hope that does come from this is is more of a uh, a sense of community because I think this has been one of the biggest issues that I see in general and I see it very see it very much in the UK much more than perhaps I do in places like Spain where I live now but um, that people really only want to live in their own bubbles and 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 generally don't want to mix is like you know is my world is very separate to your world and we're not all in this together and uh 
you know, that maybe to some degree, you know, explains things like um, panic buying and uh, mm. take, taking all, all the food away and making sure you're okay, but, uh, but not caring that other people are going to go without because, because you've, uh, because you've made sure that you were okay. Yeah. Um, the, the, now, in times of like back in sort of think back to wartime before uh, probably before either of us would have any uh have even existed really but uh mm-hmm. people pulled together people had a, a very strong sense of community and it's like well it was a very much a, a life life and death situation and maybe that there is less of a less of a sort of life and death situation like we're not we're not at war we're not being bombed there there are going to be a lot of deaths from the coronavirus and there already are and uh, and i know it's um, mostly going to be uh, elderly and vulnerable people but it's still very significant mm-hmm. and, and i hope that those things do bring us together because for for people who aren't directly affected by that or by the infections or by the by deaths in the family or uh, friends that they may feel that it's it's not really anything to do with them and I, and I hope that that doesn't really doesn't really happen i want people i want to see people come together i want to see people mm. say you know what well, we have to care for we have to care for each other we are a, a society we're, we're not just a society of individuals we are a, a a community i think um i feel like the the uk particularly lost lost to a greater degree a sense of community uh, and I would sort of maybe even go, uh, not want to go too much into the politics, but I think that I very much saw that in the 80s uh, where people were getting obsessed about making money and uh, and looking after themselves. And, uh, and, and like the, I'm not saying those things aren't important. You know, people need money to live and people should have every right to be successful, but it, it shouldn't be at the expense of other people. And, mm. uh, and, and there has to be some level of... Uh, of ethics and philosophy in a society and and i think those are things that we've lost um, to a to a greater degree there are elements of society that still have that and there are some that don't there, there is no nothing that pulls people together as much as i i'm not a fan of religion and the likes at, at least there was a <laughs> at least there's a shared sense of morality in within certain religions and a, a sense of um community and identification and, uh, and to some degree, without those sorts of things, without that like, common philosophy or without common uh, uh, understanding and, and sharing of deeper ideas um, and values, as you mentioned earlier, when we don't have those things, we, we just drift through life and we end up clinging on to whatever we cling on to. And um, very often they're meaningless things. Yes, material things. Material things, I, I think, TV I think, programs. Yes, I, th- I think what could come out of this is a lesson in what isolation feels like for people who were either ambivalent to it or inexperienced of it. Because as you say, I do feel, and, and it probably is global, but obviously my experience is here in the UK, that we have created a situation where it's not about the haves and then have nots. It's about the alones and the togethers that there were lots of people that would go out and be together and be very social and lots of people for whatever reason and even happening amongst young people so the isolation isn't just as you might think older people who um their younger families move away they're uh, an older couple they get older older one of them goes then there's just one so there's either two people or one person living alone and feeling more isolated which is you know, I saw that through my parents, although we lived just down the road, so they weren't isolated because we were with them. But you could see how if we weren't the ones there visiting, that would be the case. Um, and I listened to a lot of my friends where family lives on one side of the country and they live on the other. And we're not, we're not a very big country. We're probably like a quarter of Spain or something ridiculous. But when your lives get so busy, your ability to make that two-hour journey there to your parents and your two-hour journey back, starts to go to once a week, once every other week, once a month. And that's when the isolation builds up. Yeah. But shockingly, we've had this amongst young people, a lot of young people isolated in ways, whether they're at university. So on the front, they seem like they're participating, but then when they're withdrawing, so when they're not in class or they're not at work, they're coming back to somewhere where they are then shutting themselves off 
possibly then engaging in the social media, which reinforces their feelings of loneliness and anxiety because the fakeness of, of the online world is that everything's all right. And then there was no space for them to share this. And I hope that what will come out of this, you know, I'm, I can't say that I'm looking forward to isolation at all. But again, if out of this challenge comes an opportunity, it will be for me to go, okay, I thought I knew what isolation was. Wow, I've just had a new appreciation of this experience. And therefore, when I come out the other side, what might I do differently? How might I reach out to people? Um, we recently moved. We've only been here six months. I lived in my last house for 25 years. I knew my neighbors either side and I knew one person opposite. Mm. I didn't know diagonally opposite and diagonally opposite. And I lived there for 25 years. And, you know, there was a couple there with a big dog and they used to walk the dog. But we never spoke. Not once did we speak in 25 years. and I never went and knocked on their door. Within weeks of being in this house, um, I know two people up the road that way. I know my neighbors on either side. I know my neighbor diagonally opposite and I know three of the old dears who live a bit further down the road and I've made all right, loose friends. We're saying hello. It's early days. You know, we've not done visiting one another's houses, but I've made more connections in, in just a few weeks here than I did in 25 years there. And why was it? It was because we were centered at the house. We were doing the work on the house. So we were here all the time. We weren't engaged in our normal lives, which was get up in the morning, do your commute, go to some other location where you do your job, then eventually you commute home and then you, you're back in your house, you shut your door, you cook your meal, you watch a TV program and, and the isolation perpetuates. So hopefully that will, will all change. And one of the things that I'm doing after this call with you is at one o'clock today, we're going down um, to the local village hall because as part of the isolation I've joined my Facebook my local areas Facebook community group um, so you just search your area on Facebook and someone's bound to have set up a group and there was a post in there to say they're having a meeting to look at what we can do to support vulnerable people during this isolation process so we've already seen it with some of the students putting notes in the doors or putting posts on Facebook saying I can go and get your food or I can go and collect your medicine and prescriptions but actually they're going to now formalize that whole process. And that, that's the start of what you're talking about. That's the start of coming back as a community. Would we have done this if we didn't have coronavirus? I don't, I don't think so. I don't know. I don't At know. all. Um, it seems, seems unlikely that this is, this is I think, an, an important part to start to see that um, people are, are feeling some sense of solidarity out here. Mm. The, the government has asked that at uh, 8 o'clock every evening everyone goes out onto, uh, most people live in blo apartment blocks and stuff here, people go out onto their terraces and uh, balconies, which most people have uh, in Spain, and, and clap, give uh, applause for the emergency workers, the health workers. And, oh, awesome. and, and so ev everyone's coming out and doing that and you get this real, uh, real sense, of quite a strong emotional sense of solidarity and appreciation for the people who are working their asses off to to keep people healthy and to look after uh, the vulnerable and uh, uh, and I, so I hope that that starts to shift attitudes even more beyond this beyond this crisis um, you can you can check out videos of that uh, there's lots of videos of that uh, online if you, if you I think I saw the Italian singing but um, I was a little confused as to what else was going on yeah there, there's been a, been a lot of different things but uh, yeah I, I as I say, paradigm, paradigm shifts, that, that's what we want to see happen from all of this because um, you know, pe people are looking for, I don't know, pe people in times of crisis, they look for things to blame. They look for, mm. <laughs> sort of, I mentioned earlier that a lot of people seeing conspiracy theories and all of this. And and uh, who's, who's to say, but I don't think it's helpful to be focused on you know, who's caused this, who's to blame, who's benefiting from this. Is that mm. well? You know, I think we are we are already seeing people very much coming out against anyone who's trying to profit from um, from disaster. 
Yes. And, and I hope that that, that that attitude stays prevalent beyond this as well when we see um, drug companies that aren't, um, that aren't providing drugs um, at, at affordable prices because they are maximizing profits and, and paying, their, the, paying their shareholders. So not that they shouldn't be able to make money, but, uh, but they shouldn't be able to, um, to essentially exploit vulnerabilities in people and uh, and profit profit maximally off that and keep raising prices and and essentially causing death yeah it's it's a weird thing isn't it that just as you talked about and let's just take pharmaceuticals as as an example so there's a lot of research that goes into pharmaceuticals there's a lot of upfront costs there's a lot of risk because you don't know if it'll work and i understand all of that and that needs funding fine but somehow and I'm not saying that the state has to do everything, but because this is in private hands, the private companies have to fund that. So then they go out to shareholders and what they're saying is basically, John, lend me a hundred um, pounds. And what I'll do is I'll do some research. And if this research comes off, then I'll pay you back. But the model says, I will have to sell this thing at an extremely high price in order to pay the interest for you and then somehow recoup my cost. But somehow I think we're doing it doubly because we're putting such a high cost that we're recouping the expenses that they had and then they're paying you. And so somehow things are twice the price that they should be. And then the irony is that if the medicine is for whatchamacallit disease and you get whatchamacallit disease and you're a whatchamacallit shareholder, you would actually benefit more financially from the sale of the whatchamacallit medicine that you couldn't afford to keep you alive to um, benefit from the money. So I do feel you that a lot, of so. this, a lot of this is going to shift. And we saw it um, post-2007, 2008, and, and this ridiculousness where they could package up bad debt and then sell on the bad debt. As a, as a package of bad debt and a lot of this gambling. I mean, look at what's happened to the stock market and, and share prices and everything else. I don't understand why they just didn't suspend all trading before they let it crash. That would have, that would have made sense to me, but there must have been some reason for it. But what's happening there is people are gambling on the shares and often what they do is they're gambling on the falling so they're hedging bets they're taking is it puts and losses or something I vaguely remember the words when I briefly looked at whether this was something I wanted to do put puts and losses or something which is where you gamble whether the price will go up or you, you basically pay it place a bet as to whether the price will go up or the price will go down yeah, is it shorting bet, shorting yeah yeah there's another way for it yeah so shorting and I and I saw one post from from someone and they saying how much money they made one day trading you know they made four times the average person's salary trading in one morning and I felt slightly sick mm. I felt slightly sick because that means all the share prices have fallen the client I spoke to yesterday is trying to make a decision as to whether he cashes out on his pension now or waits because the shares have already fallen the value of his pension's already fallen he doesn't need the money right now but the pension could fall more and when it falls more how long will it take to recover he needs the pension in five years from now so does he take it now and take a hit now knowing he's already lost money because other people have profited on the share price gambling this, this is, I mean, one of the things I, I one of the things I like to talk about a lot in uh, in the podcast has been ethics, and and, mm -hmm. and generally that's sort of in in relation to influence and persuasion ethics. Mm -hmm. But um, but th this is to me an area where ethics comes up, and and I I, I hear you, I, and I get that uh, I get that. You know, I don't uh, whilst I don't teach uh, trading or or anything like that, I do teach uh, a program on uh, financial freedom. Uh, and certainly you know, trading is one of the areas that people will often invest money into to to improve their lifestyle and to get residual or essentially more less active <laughs> but, yes. but more slightly more passive income streams and there there is a bit of an issue ethically 
with those sorts of things where you, and in any kind of investment, where there are always opportunities to profit off other people's misfortune. And, and it's down, you know, it does come down to the individual as to what are your feelings around that ethically. And, but we don't, we don't really have any sort of uh, great uh, idea about that. We just, uh, we have unfettered greed to those who, uh, to those who want it. And, mm. and that's probably why we end up with the system getting abused, you know, and it, it can take us on a bit of a rabbit hole here, but, you know, you look at the, the way the world is just the way the world is run. Um, the people who want power, are the, uh, the people who are in power, are the people who want power and the people who want power uh, generally don't want it for benevolent purposes. They want it for, for the purposes of acquisition and profit and, mm-hmm. and control. And so we, we do live in a, to some degree, a psychopathically run world. Uh, say to some degree, to a great degree, where where decisions are not made for the for the benefit of the whole, they are essentially made for the benefit of the few. And like America and the UK are I see as being almost corporatocracies uh, because you know, big business has all the advantages, mm-hmm. and small business and individuals have have very few. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the, the the powerful lobbies that exist within that. I don't know if if this is going to start to change any of that. I, I can only hope that it does. Mm. Sadly, what you said about the sort of the slightly psychopathic leadership, I mean, that's been there throughout history. I mean, yeah. if you take oh, yeah, it all totally. the way back through the kings, this is not a new through thing. the Roman emperors, yeah. back to Cleopatra, it, yeah. it always has been that. Um, but I think if we just go back to that thing about sharing, just to clarify, pre the crisis, trading for me didn't have a bad feeling. You know trading i invest in property i don't think that i ever in, have ever bought a property at the loss of someone else although i've negotiated on the prices i've always been aware of their mortgage i've never pushed i've never been one to push for that extra 5 grand because i just want another 5 grand off when i look at it if i'm making enough money then i'm making enough money to make it worth the risk of investing there's just something that i think we need to look at and, and you call it ethics and it's under the influence and persuasion. And I'm talking about values. I think we're talking about exactly the same thing. Yeah. It's, um, it's a suite of words that are, are going to be really important for your listeners to hone in on, to look at what's important to them, what they value, how they're going to show up eth- ethically, and then how they can influence the future what is the future that you want to see and how can you influence that future with the message that you now start to present? And you have a choice whether that is taking a currently semi-online, offline business to more online so that you can carry on running your business. I don't see any problem if you ran a business that was um, doing a, a, a live events or live trainings um, followed with coaching to moving that online and continuing to charge for that. If that thing that you taught is something that is still going to be important in this new customer's new future, then go for it. But make sure that what you're going to put the time and effort into transferring online is still going to be important. And I do feel that communication skills are going to be important. Mm. I do still, from my side, think that looking at how your business grows and can support others is still important because business is still the way that we work and how we can bring more ethics into it. And I do also still think that, that for me, helping people who've got property portfolios or are worried about their finances and want to look at, you do, you do financial freedom, I'm doing financial security, you know, how you can protect your future going forward. And there are a lot of people going to get that financial wake-up call. I don't see why we can't continue to run our businesses and charge for the coaching or the courses that we create, because that's what our businesses are. But there's also going to be stuff, and I'm sure that you do it, like this podcast, that we're going to be doing for free, where we are sharing our insights for the benefit of the listener or the viewer for free. And so there's still going to be that element. And so you, as a listener now, need to think about your whole business model, what's relevant to your brand new customer, in their brand new future and if there is something that you can tweak of your existing business to to offer that go for it but equally if you have insights 
Um, and maybe what you want to do if your community already doesn't have a Facebook community group, set up your Facebook community group, call that community meeting in the local hall, help people, uh, you know, set up your local food bank, set up food bank deliveries, collect prescriptions. What, what do you want to do? What's important to you as a person and what's important to you as a business owner? And then using all the communication skills that you have, how you can get that message across ethically. Mm. Is, the, the ethics and values is, is is definitely interesting. One thing we are seeing with the coronavirus virus crisis is that um, people are people are really having no, no choice but to realise that if we don't look after the health of everybody, it damages everybody. Yes. And yes. Uh, and so when we're not, uh, you know, it's like when the infection starts going through, ravaging through, uh, and spreading, and certainly in in the world where we can travel so easily now, although who knows what's going to happen with that in the future. But um, but uh, you know that that's one of the reasons why this has just swept through the world that we've been able to travel so easily, and uh, and that the infection gets passed so easily, uh, and we recognise that you know. We, by, by coming together and acting as as a, a whole rather than uh, individually that we can make a difference and that mm. we can help each other and and so again it's a bit of a consciousness and global consciousness kind of issue of recognizing that that we uh, how we act with each other is important we're not just out here by ourselves and what you do can be having a, a positive or a negative impact on yes. not just your immediate surroundings but potentially the whole world yes yes fascinating it is it yeah. is fascinating and on, on, on a sort of deeper level you know one of, one of the things that has helped me particularly in in life and i'd say in business as well has been sort of diving deeper into more um philosophy and and understanding and undoubtedly learning is important but the the philosophy is important and it used to be it used to be the case like you think um you look to eight more ancient communities like uh, Rome and Greece, like ethics and philosophy. These were the kind of core subjects that were, were taught in school, more important than anything else. And you hardly ever come across that being taught, maybe sort of at degree level and things, but and maybe in some of the more uh, private or progressive schools. But but in generally in the in the education systems, it's it's not. You won't really won't really come across it you you maybe get religious education and, and you might you might get some sort of uh, um you know, philosophy thrown into that but um the philosophy as a subject itself ethics as a subject itself values understanding values are not things that people generally come across unless like, like us you've been doing working on yourself doing personal and professional development and and actually taking a bit of a deeper look at those things uh, and you know, again, I hope it's a bit of a wake-up call, a bit of a wake-up yeah. call for that as well. Like we, we need that. We, yeah. we, need, uh, we need a sense of morality. We need a sense of ethics. We need a uh, philosophy. And, uh, and we want ones that are going to be healthy for everybody, mm. hopefully. Well, you mentioned it before, didn't you, briefly? And, I mean, we, we avoided mentioning politics in any depth, and we're also avoiding mentioning religion in any depth. But mm. I do think that that was the role of religion, and I'm not advocating that we go back to that, no. because I do, I do feel that there's been a disconnect between the modern world and, and traditional religion. But it's almost like that was the ethics keeper. And of course, bizarrely, they've been shown to be somewhat unethical in certain practices so they've lost yeah. all credibility but it's how we can put that back in and uh, do you remember a meeting that we went to and i'm probably going to describe this really badly so excuse me listeners for a minute and then john's going to make sense of what i'm saying for you <laughs> we'll see. we we did we did this meeting where they talked about values and the values had a scale and they roughly went to the individual to the community to the individual to the community and there were colors and you could then assess yourself against the scale as countries, as businesses, as whatever. And it was called the somebody's value scale. And I want to say grays or something. Do you remember that? I, I do. Somebody's scale um, of values. Yeah, it's uh, Claire Graves. And, there you go. Um, Thank you. And it's um, Spiral Dynamics. Ah, 
that's what it is. So I had the memory of this. Right. So now to make this relevant to the listeners. That's actually a really great book. If, you, if you've never read Spiral Dynamics, it's a yes. really, really good book. There you go. So we're going to have loads of time on our hands yeah. alongside everything else you have to do, which is understanding your own core values, looking at how you show up ethically, looking at the relevance of your business to your new customer and their new future and how you're going to show up, how you're going to hone your presentation skills. There's a perfect opportunity here to to learn and to listen. Um, and I mentioned to you before there was a Netflix series called Pandemic, which will explain the whole coronavirus thing. If you've got Netflix, there's loads of books out there you can read. And and this idea of Claire Gray's and the spiral dynamics and the way that we shift, you know, and it's almost like um, centralized, decentralized, individual, collective, individual, collective. Um, and I feel like particularly the more American values were very individualistic. I felt red. like level yes, three red fan. Yes. And I felt like the, <laughs> the, 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 lots of the UK, UK yeah. had headed in that direction, yeah. um, which is different to the values that I see because half of me is Latin that I would see in countries like Italy, Greece, and Spain, the, the warm Italian, the warm Europeans down the bottom. I don't see that so much in maybe the French, but, and then up to the Germans are different values. So really interesting. And so then maybe there's a little piece where we could all come back on a giant webinar, having all read the book and gone, oh, that's really interesting. So look at how Germany behaved because they were this sort of value company. And then look at how Norway behaved because they were this sort of value company and look at how the UK and so on. And in terms of behaviors, one thing I just, I remembered that when I was trying to find this one in my brain, was you were talking about um, Richard Branson and the eight weeks off work and, uh, uh, and, and again, it's back to ethics, isn't it? I'm, I'm not sure if I'm now spreading a rumour because I haven't tracked the source, but my son-in-law is into football and he told me at the weekend, I think it's Ronaldo, now I could be saying the wrong footballer's name. Uh, uh, I wouldn't know. No, okay, so you're not going to be in help then this time around. But I think a Portuguese footballer or a footballer who's got hotels in Portugal has turned over his hotels to become hospitals and at his own expense he's converting those hos those hotels and and I, kitting them out as emergency. I think I read actually I'm saying I don't know I think I read something today it could be that Ronaldo's on that thing certainly Gary Neville is okay and uh that doesn't because so, I've never even heard of him <laughs> <laughs> okay well I, I couldn't tell you what what he actually does other than knowing that he was a footballer but oh, okay. uh, but yeah he's he's uh, he apparently has some hotels and that's what he's doing um and, and making sure that his uh, his workers are going to be look, taken care of as well uh, anyway, well yeah that's, great that's important isn't it that just brings us back to there are some wonderful examples out there and and I'm sure when I go to my community meeting, we're going to see the wonderful examples at a very low level, individual, community based, small area examples of people coming together as humanity. But also, whether I've said the right name of the right person, I was fairly sure that it was in Portugal, but whatever, whatever my example was and your example, you know, that there are people out there at the more affluent end of society recognizing that this is an opportunity where they can share out there much more than enough for the benefit of others. Um, yeah. And I think that gives me hope. That really does. Yeah, me, me too. I mean, the, this is one of the things we, we, I guess we've seen some of the worst of uh, what can come out in people with the panic buying and um, you know, people um, maybe uh, not caring about the health of others and just doing what they want to anyway and, and still, uh, still congregating, still going to... A buzz and, and ignoring health advice um, but we also are seeing a lot of the best of people and uh, that people will, there are many people who will come together and uh, and we can all make a difference and, and mm. the one of the things I do talk about often in terms of leadership which is a big part of uh, what what I do in, in my work you know present presenting and being influential ethically influential uh, is a big part of leadership to me and one of the core values of leadership, I think, is service, being of service to others. And so it's not about uh, being in control of others. It's not about having power over other people. It's about being in service to, to people 
that when we look at uh, if we look at leadership from that perspective and say, you know, are, are our leaders actually in service to us? <laughs> Very often, not that's just not the case. But we can be leaders, and, and we yes. can be in service to, to other people. And and with those sorts of examples, we might start to see more of that come up through society. We might even start to see it at more governmental levels and and even uh, corporate levels as well. More re- socially responsible, environmentally responsible uh, uh, leadership in in general, and uh, somewhat less uh, sociopathic values. As people uh, people recognise that we we are all in this together. As uh, one of the things that uh, Jules Wyman said <coughs> on the podcast on the podcast that I did with her is that uh, none of us are getting out of this alive, and uh, so you know we don't we don't uh, you know we 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 all have a life here together. We it's down to us to make it our best life. Mm. And one of the best ways to do that is by helping people around us as well. Yes. And I think that's, that's a lovely summary of, of all that we've been talking about, isn't it? That takes us right from, from the start of the loop all the way through. And the fact that, you know, we're going to have an opportunity to shape the future. Um, As I say, that's, that's the light that, that I'm attracted to through, through whatever murkiness and darkness and grayness and murkiness we're going to go through over the next few weeks and months and who knows how long it's going to take. But society is never going to be the same again. And I believe that we all have a role to play in working out what it is that we want, to sharing our message, to then bringing people together under those collective messages and hopefully in a collaborative way, not in an oppositional way that what we're going to do is we're going to find people who are going to work on how to um, multiply the benefits that we've seen in the way that we are currently uh, moving about you know um, and and that sort of transportation and the factories and the impact on the environment and then there are going to be people that are going to work on society mental health and the way that we are together and then there are going to be people that will work on money and they're going to be people and and we are i i always thought 2020 was going to be the start of an amazing new decade i didn't think that it was going to be a global shift in quite the way i did think it was going to be somewhat milder than this i thought it was going to be amazing but i didn't think that we were going to go through through the mill to get there but I still feel that we've got a an incredible opportunity ahead of us we've got to take care of our own health we need to look out for others but I see a positive light at the end of this and I feel that we all have a a a role to play yeah I mean um, in countries that don't have universal health care the need for that has suddenly become very very apparent and uh, you know in the in the US where they where they don't have that um, they're they're seeing you know that they they have uh, they've had like Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren arguing for for universal health care in the US and people were challenging that saying it's a, a radical idea and now, now we're saying maybe it's not because you know, we, we actually need to look after everybody's health and seeing how many people are going to become uh, bankrupt over this and how much how much wealth is still kind of hidden <laughs> in and kept by such small groups of uh, of the world that, that unnecessarily that um, that that can't continue either. Mm. That uh, we do may- maybe need to look at things like universal basic income, which again has been not getting talked about nearly enough, especially as mm. we go into a, a world where you know many people's jobs and uh, businesses are going to be replaced by robots and AI uh, as as we advance, and that's already happening. That, that's yeah, going on. yeah, it was already the threat, wasn't it? Yeah, uh, and so you know, they, those changes were coming anyway, and, and we might see those sort of being a bit more advanced uh, in, in the, yes. as as the opportunity arises, I suppose. But uh, the, the the principle is that people people still need to be looked after. And do we do we get to this point where we divide and say, okay, well, you know, it's going to be more like the Hunger Games: the rich live in one place and the poor are, uh, all, all outside of that and uh, hunting and fending for themselves, or do we actually? find ways to come together and look after um, look after each other and, and maybe create a more harmonious and beneficial world. I hope for the latter. <laughs> but, uh, but well, I know. think if there's one advantage of all the stories that have played out through movies, 
the one thing that we learn from any form of Hunger Games style approach where the rich go one place and the poor go somewhere else is it never works. It never ends well. It never works. It never ends well. And therefore, we don't even need to consider that as an opportunity. I believe that we, the ordinary people, can really use this time of reflection to understand what's important to us. And we are, we, I really believe that we are going to be in a position to shape the future. The purchases that you make when you come out of this, you're going to make different decisions on because you'll know what's important to you. Because mm. I, I, I was doing a talk, I think it was just Monday week ago, and, and the talk was sort of out of my book, The Wealthy Retirement, and I was talking about how people have a mortality moment. So a mortality moment, mortality moment pre-coronavirus was when you had a car accident or a friend had a car accident or you got a quite a serious illness or a friend or a family member did or, or even a family member died and you had one of these shocking moments that made you go, oh, I'm not immortal. This could all end and therefore what's important to me? And you would split into two ways. You would split into someone who then became fearful and you went into sort of the negative protective mode life's short so it doesn't really matter what I do because I'm going to die anyway I'm probably going to die early so I just don't need to prepare financially for the future I don't need to care about anything and you just become very in the moment and then you could split the other way where you go wow I've, I've got another day every day is precious time is precious it's my most important resource and I am going to invest in the quality of my life going forward and adjust the things that matter to me and family matters to me or friends matter to me or my health matters to me or whatever so you would you would polarize and and I feel that this is and the irony is speaking about this a week ago because literally Monday week ago we weren't we weren't where we are today 10 days later is so shockingly different that the talk I gave then I was saying to someone I can't believe I gave that talk last Monday and it was so almost out of touch. But what it was, was it was scale one conversation. And now we're at like scale eight conversation. But it's the same thing. We're having a mortality moment. And we have a choice how we each come out of this. When we come out of this, if we could collectively feel that time is precious, understand what our values are, understand what's important to us, individually and then look for the gatherings of those then we're going to be in a position where we're going to have a much better society when we come out the other end and, yeah. and we have a role to share those values in that ethical way to become those leaders i believe we can have a, a society that could more easily cope with and weather these kinds of situations without having to have this this kind of panic just by having the right kind of infrastructure and uh, and people having more commonly shared values and uh, a stronger sense of community and and there may be there, there may be other benefits to come from this you know and definitely there's going to be a lot of challenges for people and i know that there will be people who are who are still in panic stations about this and and uh, and there may still be there may still be some shit to go through for for a lot of people we just don't know until mm. we until we get to it um but the thing is as uh, churchill said when you're going through hell keep going yeah we, we'll, we'll get through it we yeah. we'll, we will get through it one way or another and we, we must find ways to pull together and um i hope we can find ways to make some make not just one thing positive out of this but many positive changes and shifts from from what's been going on um i feel that uh, we're going to have to have a, another podcast <laughs> sometime vicky so we can actually talk about some of the some of the things we had originally planned because yeah because we we really have shifted because of what's been going on we've shifted what we're going to talk about but i think it's been important to do that and and i'm really glad we've uh, we've addressed what's what's currently going on and 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 hopefully even help some people sort out their thinking about it or yeah, take a bit of a positive approach to uh, to the future and, and to what opportunities there there may come from this as well and so so i hope we can uh, can maybe arrange an, another podcast further down the line to to talk about your books and your presenting and uh, all the stuff we'd originally uh, yeah. perhaps planned to but uh, before before we wrap up for today is there a, a message that you would really an overall message you'd like to leave everyone with um, I think it's just to reiterate what I've said, that 
in amongst all of this apparent darkness, I firmly believe there is a light at the end of the tunnel and that that light represents a wonderful new world that we have an opportunity to co-create. And the way that we can co-create that is to start off calming our minds, working on our mindsets, understanding what's important, doing what's necessary to protect ourselves, but not at the cost of others. And then look at, well, we're going to have to constantly look at how the world is evolving and look at what, have, what resources do we have? What do we have in the way of knowledge and experience that we can share with others for the benefit of others and for the ongoing benefit of the future. I mean, my experience of, of understanding maths and spreadsheets and financial planning, which is something I bang on about all the time. You'll find it in all of my books in one shape or another, how important maths is. Really, maths and money are probably a small thing of importance given what's going on in the world. But actually, our society is based on it. So it's always there. You know, if I can go down to the village hall and I can offer to put on a helpline for anybody in my community that, that's struggling. And in fact, I'm in the middle of writing a series of emails to go out to my database. I'll make the same offer to your podcast listeners that if they are struggling financially and, and they don't need to be struggling financially as out of money struggling financially, but worrying about money and they want to come on for, for a call, I'll happily have calls with people and I'll, um, I'll give you a link. So either my email or a, an appointee thing that everybody can just book a, book a call if they want to. Well, great. That, that's a really generous offer, Vicky. I'm, I'm definitely going to put links to, to that so people can connect with you into the information for the podcast and, uh, and some information around some of your books. I, I strongly encourage people to check out Vicky's books and find out more about her and and take a look at uh, you know especially if you're looking for speaker engagements nights although it might be virtual for a while uh, that uh, the Vicky would be a great person to have uh, as your speaker and whatever questions and things you may have for Vicky you can you can direct to her and uh, that would be great I'm really I really appreciate you coming on the show and, and it's been a very interesting conversation I think we could have gone much deeper but we both yeah. have uh, we both have other things to get on with as well today uh, but uh, we will hopefully have another chat in the future to talk about uh, slightly less urgent things and uh, more about presentation and influence and book writing and that kind of stuff which is going to be a lot of fun as well but in the meantime you know, I think we've shared some hopefully some valuable insights and taking a look at uh, values and ethics and all sorts of other things and let's hope we can we can make this a better world out of this time of crisis so I think that's going to be the theme for uh, the podcast that we'll promote it on and uh, in the time when everyone's sort of focused or obsessing about uh, about the virus and health that thinking about making a better world in the future is going to be a, a much healthier thing. Lovely. Thank you. I, I really appreciate the opportunity, John, and look forward to speaking to you again. Thanks for tuning in. If you enjoyed the podcast, please make sure you like and subscribe to stay updated for future episodes. If you think you'd make a great guest on the Loki podcast, or you know someone who would, or you have any feedback that might help us to improve the show in the future, please email me directly, john at presentinfluence.com, or visit the Present Influence website, or our LinkedIn, Facebook, or Twitter accounts. We look forward to hearing from you and connecting with you there, and seeing you again on a future episode of the Loki podcast.